Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to Ars Minerva Cocktails and Chit Chat series. Tonight, Cocktails is the artist. Oh, cheers. 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 My name is Celine Ricci, and I'm the director of Ars Minerva. So for those who don't know us, uh, we, um, our mission is to recreate uh, operas that haven't been played since their creation in the 17th century or 18th century. Um, and uh, tonight, Cocktails and Chit Chat session is dedicated to composer Antonia Padoani Bimbo. So I have the pleasure to uh, be joined tonight by soprano Aura Veruni. Thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, very, very happy to be here tonight. It's pretty amazing to be able to do that uh, online and to present her work and her very interesting life. Uh, so yes, looking forward to, um, to um, telling you more about her. And uh, our psychord is Kelly Savage. Thank you, Kelly, for being with us. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Nice to see you all. And yeah. also by mezzo-soprano Kindra Sharish. Thank you, Kindra. <laughs> uh, so at the end of the session, we are going to answer questions. So if you want to write in the chat questions that we will answer them at the end. And so tonight, uh, we will, as I told you before, we will introduce you to the life of composer Antonia Padoani Bimbo and perform three vocal pieces by her. And so because of social distancing, we have recorded uh, everything with uh, um, a software called Acapella. And then we have put everything together. Um, and so here we go. So uh, Antonia Bimbo was born in Venice in 1640. Her last name actually was Padoani. She was the daughter of one of the most uh, important physicists in Venice. And uh, musicologist Claire Fongin reports in her book, Desperate Measures, that Antonia was a prodigy child, but also kind of a rebel. And apparently she didn't obey to her mother, so it, it was driving everyone crazy in the family. Uh, her parents give her an amazing, amazing education, which was very rare for girls at that time. Antonia had a very high education in music. She was a gifted singer and a composer at a very young age. Her father called her the girls who sings because of her incredible voice and virtuosity. At an early age, she started to compose pieces that she would later put in her album, Produzioni Armoniche. And in our following slide, we can see that her teacher was nothing less than composer Francesco Cavalli, who was himself the student of Claudio Monteverdi, the father of opera. And uh, composer Francesco Cavalli invented the business of opera as it's still today. So um, nothing has changed, maybe right now because of the COVID. Um, but um, um, uh, Cavalli also invented the business of opera during carnival because the carnival season in Venice was the opera season. And this brings us to the following slide. Uh, Antonio Cavalli wrote 41 operas. Some of them have been lost. And here you have an example of three operas, uh, Giazzone, La Didone, and Ercole Amante. And Ercole Amante, remember this one because it's very important for us later on. And he wrote it for the wedding of Louis XIV. Uh, and uh, um, Cavalli was also the teacher of other uh, women composer at that time. And if we go to the next slide, we can see Barbara Strozzi, amazing Venetian composer. Um, and uh, so Cavalli was very, very modern for, for her time. Um, and um, Antonia in her education had also other teachers uh, like Francesco Corbetta that we can see in the next slide who was a guitar virtuose, um, and uh, they spent a lot of time together. Um, they met at the court of the Duke of Mantua that we can see in the next slide. So the Duke of Mantua was a great patron of the arts. And so Francesco Cavalli was also 
at his court. And um, so what happened is that Antonia was actually suddenly engaged to guitarist uh, Francesco Corbetta. And so she was in this music world and the Duke of Mantua wanted to hire her, but unfortunately she decided otherwise. And which bring us to our next slide. She decided to, she, she actually met a, a young nobleman. His name was Lorenzo Bimbo. Here comes the name. And she fell in love with him. They married. They had three children, one girl and two boys. And then he left for Crete for a war. And after the war, he didn't come back immediately. And he was actually cheating on her all over Europe and have kids everywhere. So he came back five years later. She brought him to court for abandoning her and her children, being physically abused by him, raping the house personnel and stealing her money and properties. And everything has been rejected by the tribunal. So she tried to divorce and the tribunal didn't want. So what to do? Well, only one thing, which brings us to the next slide. She decided to leave, to escape. And she escaped during carnival, which her former fiance, Francesco Corbetta. And when they arrived in Paris uh, during the escape, Francesco Corbetta organized for her an addition for the king, Louis XIV, in order to have health protection and a pension. And she sang for him one of her songs that she wrote and was in her album, the Produzioni Armoniche, that you can see in the next side, slide. Abi Pieta di me. And Kindra, can you tell us a little bit about this song she sang to audition for the king? I can. Thank you, Senin. So this, uh, this piece is in ABA form. The A section says, have pity on me. Do not let me die. My faith does not deserve it. My suffering does not wish for it. And this is a very kind of melancholic A section. And then it goes into a kind of passion passionate, impassioned B section says, the evil way of ungrateful fate condemns me to a thousand pains. My suffering comes from my beloved. My life gives me death without hoping for a reward for my long servitude. And then we repeat to the have pity on me. Do not let me die. My faith does not deserve it. My suffering does not wish it. Ringrazio a sorte in mio, danno al mille per me il mio 
So we're left hanging in this moment of suspense. What did Louis XIV say to Bembo as she petitioned for help from him? In Italy at this time, there are records of Bembo's death because her goods and her jewelry were being inventoried off to pay for the debts of her daughter who was living at a convent. But in fact, Bembo was very much alive. She lived another 40 years until she was about 80 years old in Paris. Her petition to the king was granted and she remained under his patronage for the rest of her life. In France, she transitioned from a performing singer to a composer and she dedicated all of her compositions either to the king or to members of the royal family. So this is a picture of the court at Versailles in 1682, right when Bembo was arriving in Paris. This is just outside Paris. Bembo would have visited this court, but she didn't actually live here. She remained a bit of an outsider. Instead, the first five years that she was in Paris, Bembo lived with the community of Italian expats. Specifically, she was taken in by the community of Comédie Italienne that lived and worked in this area of Paris. These were Italian actors who were part of the Commedia dell'arte. They were employed by the royal family and also gave public performances. Corbetta, our guitarist friend from earlier, had ties to this community and probably helped to settle Bembo there. We know that Bembo set the poetry of some of the members of this group. So if you look at this modern map of Paris here, we see the black X. This is where the Italian expat community was located. And if you know Paris, you can kind of orient yourself just south on this map is the Louvre. And you see in the left hand corner is the Opera House. So this is a picture of the hotel theater where the um, Italian actors actually lived and worked. And this is a picture from 1767. And the following picture here is a picture of one of these Commedia dell'arte troops. And this is from a Parisian artist showing a troupe in the early 18th century. So this is right around when Bembo was living there. So here we see a second map 
After Corbetta's death in 1681, Louis XIV, so that's five years after she arrived in Paris, Louis XIV helped resettle Bembo in a semi-cloistered women's community. This was called the Petite Union Chrétienne, and it was connected with the Church of the Lady of Our Good News. So she lived at the Petite Union Chrétienne for the rest of her life and composed all of the music that we have from her at this residence. This institution had two missions. First, it took in and educated girls who had newly converted to Catholicism. And second, it housed and supported between 10 and 40 women pensioners like Bembo who lived as lay sisters. The lay sisters lived in a separate house from the cloistered nuns, but on the same street. And this is the X that you see marked in red on this map. And you see the X marked in black was where she was formerly living with the Italian actors. So she only actually moved a few blocks in Paris and was still living in the same area. In her compositions, Bembo bridged the divide between the secular songs of the Italian actors, the sacred songs for the religious French community where she lived, and the songs for the royal court. So she wrote in French, Italian, and Latin, and achieved a true mix between the French and Italian musical styles. So here is a list of the manuscripts that we have surviving from Bembo. We have the Harmonic Productions, which is a collection of 41 songs. These are in a variety of styles. Some are secular, some are sacred, some are French, some are Italian. Some of these she probably composed when she was living in Venice and sang them when she was a younger woman. And then she wrote them down when she got to Paris. And then moving forward, we have a Te Deum. We have her big opera. And then we have a second Te Deum from 1708. And finally, we have a setting of the seven songs of David from 1710. So the next song that we are going to hear tonight is from Bembo's Harmonic Production Song Collection. And to introduce this, I'm going to turn it over to Aurelie. Thank you. In this song called uh, Ah que l'absence est un cruel martyr, um, in this piece, this is about a woman who is very much in love with this man, but has not disclosed her love for him. And now that he's gone, she's uh, she's really longing for him and and she just and her desire to see him again is truly truly great um, so this is what I will be singing uh, in this song Cool. 
Now I just want to touch on two of Bembo's later works. Here we see a picture of Maria of Savoy. She married the eldest son of Louis XIV. Like Bembo, she was an Italian living in Paris and she became one of Bembo's biggest patrons. Here we see the manuscript for Bembo's Te Deum. This is a big choral work that she wrote in 1704. And she wrote this and dedicated it to Maria of Savoy to celebrate the birth of her first son. And if we look at the manuscript here, we see that she's expanded from writing for Basso Continuo and one voice. We now have three voices on the top, and you see on the bottom we have an expanded instrumental group too. We have two violins and continuo. And as we get into the later works, we see that she continued to expand her orchestration. This next slide is her second Te Deum. This is from uh, four years later, 1708. And this was to celebrate a military victory of uh, Louis XIV. So if we take a look at this manuscript, you see we're now in an orchestral setting of six voices, so quite a bit different than the solo songs that we saw earlier. And I didn't put a manuscript here, but as we continue into the vocal parts, you see full chorus. So a much bigger texture that was influenced by the French orchestration. So the final section that we're gonna talk about and explore a little bit tonight is from Bembo's opera. And for this, I'm gonna turn it back over to Celine. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, so um, Bembo wrote an opera and the opera is Ercole Amante, Hercules in Love in 1707. And remember at the beginning we saw her teacher, uh, Francesco Cavalli wrote an opera, Ercole Amante, for the wedding of Louis XIV. Well, she wrote this opera on the same text than her teacher, and then she made a gift to the king. So this belonged to the king, she gave it to him. Um, so, and it was for her a way to, to um, uh, do a homage to her teacher and at the same time to the king who has supported her during her life. And if we go to the next slide, we can see actually, this is a piece of staging of the Ercole Amante of Francesco Cavalli. Unfortunately, her Ercole Amante has never been performed entirely, even during her life. Uh, so the synopsis of this is very complicated, but uh, if I make a long, very long story short, <laughs> is actually Hercules is in love with the fiance of his son, his own son and he would do anything to be with this woman. Uh, so you can imagine all the drama that goes on. Um, and uh, he, he asked the help of other gods or goddesses to, to, to make this woman fall in love with him. And in the end, it doesn't work. And actually Hercules dies and he's in heaven, marries beauty. But during the opera, uh, so the fiancé, of his son uh, is desperate because she can't escape Hercules. And at one point she thinks that her fiance is dead. And so she wants to kill herself. Uh, she wants to join him. And uh, she thinks that she hasn't loved him enough and that she, was, she thought that life was the most important thing. And suddenly she thinks that death is more important than life and that you learn more by people who give their life than by people who are still alive. And so she goes uh, on with this aria that uh, Kelly and I think has even not been performed since uh, during her time and that have might only been in her head. <laughs> Thank you. 
and uh, so Antonia uh, lived in Paris until her death uh, around um, 1720 and she was about 80 and uh, here is our little portrait of, for about her life <laughs> maybe we can come back to uh, Great. And in the chat. So thank you so much for joining tonight.